I make that three o'clock, so uh, let's get started. Uh, my name's Ian Cooper. Uh, my various socials are there on the screen in front of you. Um, uh, my DMs on Twitter are open, and I'm usually very happy to take uh, communication from you folks if you've got specific questions you want to ask kind of afterwards. Um, this talk today is about reactive architectures. So uh, a brief overview would be we're going to look at what we mean by reactive, um, reactive programming and reactive systems, and really how the insights of reactive programming can help us build uh, better architectures. That's just me. Uh, it, it essentially says I'm old. Um, I always draw at the bottom point, which is, you know, I got into this gig years ago because of speaking because uh, I started a .NET user group, and there was nobody that could speak about .NET because it, we did it in 2002 when it was still in beta, so we had to do it ourselves. So I got used to the idea of standing in front of an audience and speaking, but it's not. I'm not here because I'm smarter. I just had the opportunity to build up the confidence to do it. So please uh, think about doing it yourself. It's definitely worthwhile. Any .NET developers in the room? Yeah. It's good there's a whole load of us at one place. Um, I work on an open source project called Brighter. It's a messaging framework primarily, competes with mass transit and end service bus. We are also effectively a, what we call a command processor, which effectively competes with things like Mediator. Uh, we predate Mediator um, by some time, but you've probably never heard of us. But please do check us out. We don't have as good PR as Jimmy. All right, let's talk about the reactive manifesto first of all, just so we can get clear um, kind of what our scope is. Has anyone heard of the reactive manifesto or seen it? Yeah, quite a few of you, okay. So the reactive manifesto came out in 2014 and it was basically by uh, Jonas Bonner, but there's a few luminaries of the industry that helped him uh, kind of write it. And I'm sure you recognize some of the names in there. Um, and they wanted to create a, a new architectural style called reactive applications, inspired a lot by the ideas that came from reactive programming. And they had some characteristics they were trying to achieve. They wanted to create applications that would react to events. So they wanted to be event driven um, because it had the following qualities. They felt that being event-driven would let essentially them write applications which scaled to load more easily. That they would be resilient to failure. And that they would be able to be responsive to users. So in other words, as users effectively uh, were added to the system, we would continue to be able to respond to them in a timely fashion. And they essentially said, these properties are valuable. Being responsive, system responds in a timely manner, resilient, the system stays responsive in the presence of failure, elastic, the system stays responsive under varying workloads, and message driven. We rely on asynchronous message passing. And often, we use this diagram to represent that. So the idea is by the means of being message driven, we are able to achieve properties of elasticity and resilience, which both in turn work together to make us responsive to users. And this talk is not uh, about a specific reactive programming model. We will go through them, but I'm not here to tell you about, you know, ACA or Orleans or a given actor framework, right? So if that's what you've come for, there is still time to exit the building. Um, but we will talk about reactive programming and what it, the models that basically fall under that heading to understand how we can use those ideas to achieve those properties in reactive architectures. So the first half we'll talk about um, reactive programming. We'll talk about data flow, actor model, and flow-based programming. In theory, CSP, communicating sequential processes, is also really a reactive programming model, but I'm not going to cover that today. And then we'll get into reactive systems. What are the principles and patterns we can use to achieve those properties in the large? Uh, 
But there's a key idea to all of this, which is probably expressed by the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. I will try the ancient Greek. It's going to be awful. Apologies to anyone Greek in the audience. I think it's tarpantare kai uden menai, which means everything flows and nothing stays. And the idea is that we want to focus on flow. What's important to us when we think about a system and how we model it and how we, deal with, how we, how we decide its architecture is the flow of information through the system. How is that a contrast to what you may be doing today? All right. So we'll talk a little bit about objects and SOI. That's not the world we want to live in, and we will talk about what the problems are from that world from the point of view of uh, moving to a larger uh, canvas. Then we'll get into reactive. We'll run through some of the ideas in reactive programming. And then towards the end, we'll see how we can apply them to systems. So I'd expect nearly all of us are familiar with the idea of object-oriented programming. Okay. So an object-oriented programming, we have a class. And a class, loosely, we could define as a role in our system. It has responsibilities, actually. And it has, essentially, to fulfill those responsibilities, some behaviors and some state. And usually, the idea is that the state we encapsulate and hide, which is the, th the state required to exhibit a given set of behaviors. There's usually coupling between the behaviors in the class and the state that the class basically manages and owns. And our system tends to consist of a number of these classes that basically pass messages to each other in, in object-oriented terms. I mean, we think of that as a method call, but in OO theory, it's seen as message passing. And in some cases, we can say that, hey, this role I, derives from another role, and we can use dynamic dispatch to basically make sure that we effectively uh, root stuff to the correct derived role instead. But OO tends to rely on an approach we call call and return. Now, that just means you have a main method, which is the entry point, and everything effectively proceeds from calls from the main method to other things. right? Okay. Service orientation, SOA, was really this idea of taking object orientation and, if you like, doing it at a macro level to produce a system. So our services were roles within our system. And they had responsibilities, and they were defined often by operations rather than methods. But the same thing, really, the behaviors in the system. And typically, what we would do is co-locate operations and the state required to fulfill those operations within the system. And so effectively, um, uh, they are effectively, if you think about them, operation uh, uh, methods on a class. And often, when we built something like a SOAP service, that's exactly what we did, right? We went away and created a class, just gave it some markup, and exposed it via effectively SOAP. And the problem with that kind of design is what we bring with us is this kind of call and return model. So we bring this idea of there ought to be some kind of main method that is actually going to initiate these calls to these things that abstract entities and behavior. So typically what happens is we have some kind of API gateway layer which orchestrates the work amongst all of these entity services that we own. Um, or we might have some saga pattern living in some external command processor. And these things have a couple of problems. They become bottlenecks quite quickly, and they externalize an amount of our logic away from the individual services into this god thing that basically represents the main method in our distributed system. And often we find ourselves not with a truly distributed system, but just a distributed monolith, no matter how hard we try. The other problem with these systems is that because they typically use RPC-style synchronous conversation, be that SOAP, gRPC, even HTTP plus JSON, they're not resilient to failure. If we lose an individual service, 
then the operation being orchestrated from the gateway or the saga often basically stops working. So the question is, can we look at, say, reactive programming, which in the 1970s was an alternative proposal to OO as the way forward in programming, and see if it actually has any insights that lead to better system design. And a lot of what's happened in these sort of past 10 years or so is that people have said, hey, the reactive programming people, although they didn't win the programming war, actually had some really good ideas, and maybe we should think about basically what they were saying. All right. So reactive programming really starts something called data flow programming, which comes from somebody called Jack Dennis. Uh, Jack really writes the first paper. The ideas have been floating around for a while in various academic circles. And what Jack says is we should see our program as a series of nodes that represent operations or transformations to data, and a series of arcs that move between those nodes that represent data flowing between those nodes. Hence the name data flow programming. Right. So rather than encapsulating state and behavior together, we separate it. We say effectively, actually, we want to have behavior, and we want to flow the state through those behaviors where it will be transformed. So when we think about one of these nodes, they have a typical set of characteristics. They tend to have an input port and an output port, sometimes more than one, which allows data to flow into the node for the transformation and transform data to flow out. And that node is basically a unit of computation. Under data flow programming, a node is activated or fired because there is data waiting on a port, and therefore that causes it to come into existence. It comes into existence, it's fired, it processes that data, and it pushes an answer out the far side. The data packets, the data packets effectively can be anything. Data flow programming doesn't really say too much about them. It can be structured, unstructured, and maybe effectively even include other data packets. And these arcs, you can look at them as pipes, and they connect various nodes. Now, there are a couple of different models in data flow programming supports. One is a synchronous model, in which essentially these arcs are not buffered, they don't have a capacity, and data just basically moves through all of the nodes. If you buffer the arcs, though, Right. So the arcs effectively have a capacity. They can hold a certain number of pieces of data at waiting. Then that allows us, essentially, to parallelize the operation, because each node can run and process, basically, the work in its buffer, put work on the other buffer at a different rate to other nodes. Right. So each node can independently run, spin along eating and putting stuff outside, and they can operate in parallel. We are constrained by the slowest node in the pipeline in terms of our throughput, but we are able to effectively run all these nodes independently, provided we have some kind of notion of buffering. Okay. Um, in the classic model, basically, I think we mentioned earlier, effectively, the lifetime is essentially just there's work waiting to be done, and we basically don't have a node when there's no work waiting to be done. If there's no capacity on the output, what we do is we don't activate a node in order to basically read input. And this effectively acts as a form of back pressure. It says, if the downstream from me is at capacity, potentially because it's working much slower than I am. Don't read new items of data from the input. Just leave them where they are. So I won't activate the node. And that creates back pressure, which stops effectively us filling up the buffers too much if we are effectively going too fast. And the big advantage is the perception that Data flow programming is data coupling. 
So when we think about coupling, there's kind of a chain of tightness to looseness. So content is essentially, I know how your code works. Common is we share some global state. Control is uh, you send some feature flags and stuff that configure my behavior down with you. Stamp is I may not use all of the fields of the data that you're sending me. So essentially, there's potentially a risk that if I wanted to drop that field or et cetera, um, I might not know if we're stamp coupled, that you, were the, that you don't use it. And data coupling, effectively, is, the, is like the, the best form of coupling we, can, we, we have, which is you just couple to the shape of the data that you use. So these nodes are effectively at least stamp coupled and probably, if we're doing a good job, data coupled, which means that there's low coupling between these nodes. All right. Actors. So traditionally, when we, in programming, used to try and deal with the problem of access to a mutable resource in the presence, basically, of wanting to scale, what would happen is people would basically introduce multiple threads to scale, but then have to use some kind of synchronization primitive to control access to the mutable state. And this sort of multi-threaded programming, as I'm sure most of you have done at some point in your life, is typically error-prone and problematic. So Carl Hewitt created the actor model as a kind of variation of data flow programming in order to try and solve this problem of how do I scale without running into the problem of synchronization primitives. So an actor is really just a node in data flow programming. It's a single threaded node. And essentially, it has a mailbox, which you can think of as a buffered input, which allows a single thread to simply chew its way through a set of work. And it may effectively then control a mutable uh, piece of state because it's always going to apply, change that mutable state in order, and you don't need a synchronization primitive. In the actor model, then actors can send messages from one actor to another actor. Each actor has a unique address. And we can effectively use that address to send messages to it. And we get, a message, we get addresses for other actors because we created it, it was passed to us, or it passed to us on a message. Okay. So the model in the actor model creates a dynamic graph. Right. We don't have to have a fixed graph at the beginning. We can essentially create the graph as we go. A key aspect here is basically it lets us effectively create uh, partitioned data in order to scale. So if effectively I want to scale shopping carts, and I'm, I effectively own shopping cart state in one of my nodes, then the problem will be that I can read messages for all of the shopping carts that I own in, that, in say, node 2. And I can process them in sequence. But I may get overwhelmed at that point because the number of messages waiting in my inbox and my single thread that I have running in my node may, ex may mean that I get a huge amount of latency and lag processing those shopping carts. Right. So I need to partition. And by partitioning, what I mean is that effectively I add another node processing shopping carts. And it's going to have shopping carts 1 to 20. And node 2 is going to have shopping carts 21 to 40, right? And that enables me then to, use, to scale single-threaded nodes by scaling out. But note that effectively what I need to do is partition, but it's OK because the parent that creates the sub-nodes understands effectively where the shopping carts live because it was the thing that did the partitioning in the first place. Let's look at flow-based programming. So flow-based programming is another reactive programming approach. And this came out of J. Paul Morrison in the 70s. So in flow-based programming, again, we have a node. And the node has an in port and an out port. And we have connectors between the nodes. 
In flow-based programming, connectors are always buffered. We are always asynchronous when we are using flow-based programming. It does not allow us to use essentially a, uh, a, a non-buffered synchronous approach basically to our data flow. Okay. Data flows are typically push or pull. So uh, a push-based data flow tends to say uh, work is essentially given to your, your graph, and a pull-based one says uh, I yank on the graph. So one polls and one receives. Um, Rather than data, what flow-based programming talks about is an information packet. An information packets flow between nodes through ports, and it's this work of data throwing through transforms that basically gets work done. Okay. Packets have a known lifetime. So packets essentially are only exist for their time on the pipe. What happens is, is that when a node has successfully read a, a job off basically the import and done its work, it deletes that work. As it's done, and it puts something on the out. Right, so we, so effectively we garbage collect packets is what flow-based flow programming refers to it as. Node allows us to do a couple of things, uh, flow-based programming allows us to do a couple of things when effectively our buffer begins to fill up. Okay. Oh, I think it's the next slide, but I'll just one first. All right, yeah, node basically says, uh, yeah, rather than just saying activation is the only work, uh, work on the input port is the only, it activates our, our node. Flow-based programming says, hey, it may be expensive to start up a node, so you can start up a node and keep it running, and it will just pull things off the buffered uh, connector. And that allows, basically, under the flow-based programming model, us to have long-lived nodes. In terms of capacity, as well as the back pressure we saw earlier with data flow programming, where essentially we say, if there is no room on the output channel, don't read from the input channel, flow-based programming also introduced the idea of load shedding. It said, Hey, if we get too much work coming in for the output, we can simply drop it on the floor. Take the packet, delete it, and don't do the work. Now, you may say, wow, that's going to be, I'm losing all my work. But there are certain circumstances where that may be quite valuable. So, uh, I work today in the kind of food delivery business. So, think of something like drive notifications. The driver notifying you continuously where they are, right? If you're getting a lot of information and you're being overwhelmed, you can drop some of those because all that happens is the driver will just seem to jump on the map and, and flow less smoothly because you effectively only get every fifth one, etc. But that's usually acceptable in the presence of load. So as well as back pressure, the other thing flow-based programming tends to teach us is that we can do load shedding. Okay. A couple of other interesting things in flow-based programming. So flow-based programming introduces this idea that you could have multiple ports. Right. Ports in, in flow-based programming are just named things, and the idea in the program is basically you address something by name, and effectively the framework handles how actually a port works. You, you have no real understanding of that. You just know that you connect to, uh, you send something to out or other out, and you receive things from in, right? Multiple writers can write to an import, and that allows us effectively to receive signals from multiple places. Um, but we only have one thread writing to any given output internally in flow-based programming. Right. Flow-based programming uh, in about 2010, J. Paul Morrison, who'd long retired, uh, he pointed out then that, you know, he was looking at the kind of modern era, uh, what it didn't exist when he, when he created flow-based programming, he saw message-oriented middleware as a perfectly valid way of implementing the connectors that flow-based programming had talked about, and that flow-based programming could be seen in the large as a way of basically building distributed systems. Um, flow-based programming also has this idea of an, in, a, an initial information packet. This idea when I start up, I have a specific queue from which I can grab a message 
which tells me how to configure myself at startup. Interestingly enough, anyone who's worked with MQTT, MQTT, which is quite often used with devices running on unreliable connections, has a very similar model. These are not an IoT. You can you start up effectively an MQTT has a the model of taking an initial information packet and configuring yourself. It also has the notion of control packets. So the idea in flow-based programming is that if I have a particularly large message uh, that I want to chunk up into a stream, on the port I send you an initial control packet which tells you to expect a stream and how many chunks I think are going to be in there, sends you the chunks and then sends you effectively a control packet to tell you the stream is done uh, uh, and, and you can basically you know, move on to the next item. Um, uh, often, basically, control packets are referred to uh, in flow-based programming as brackets. It's the idea that I'm putting parentheses about the things that are about to come down the pipeline. Uh, all very useful ideas. Okay. The other thing in flow-based programming, of course, is that basically it, it, one of the things it tries to look at is this question of, uh, well, if basically everything is done by flowing from one node to the next node, what happens if my node needs information in order to process the data it's received? Where does it get it from? So in flow-based programming, right, there's no notion of I can make a method call to that thing over there, which in a distributed system is the equivalent, and we'll see again later, of me saying I'm going to make an HTTP GET or a GRPC call to get something in a messaging environment. So Morrison's solution in flow-based programming is, well, all that component B needs to do here in this, in this diagram is ha have a port that effectively listens to signals and build from, from A and effectively builds a lookup table. And here we actually can see it as potentially a node that effectively listens to that, builds a lookup table that B uses. And that means that effectively, when A has a change, A produces basically a data packet on its node saying, hey, the information you need to look up has changed. And then effectively, we pass it across to the lookup node, which writes it into the table that B then uses to reference stuff. So in a distributed system, this is this idea effectively that you know I want to look up customers or restaurants or brokers or some kind of other kind of reference data. And what I do is wait for the system that produces that to produce a data packet, which then I can use to build a lookup. Okay. All right. So how do we apply some of these reactive programming concepts to build um, larger systems? And why does uh, Reactive Manifesto talk about this idea of message passing, resilience, Elasticity and responsiveness, right? How, how does this actually work to produce stuff? Okay. So the idea in reactive systems is to model ourselves in the same way we do in reactive programming. We think of our services as nodes that receive data and it's a very uh, much a uh, flow-based programming model of it must be basically an asynchronous connector. We receive data on some asynchronous connector. So Kafka, RabbitMQ, SQS as your service bus, take your pick. Right. We then do perform some kind of transformation, and then we pass the data down the line. Right. The advantage of message passing and the buffering it offers us in an asynchronous conversation is that both parties do not need to be present for a conversation to succeed. So think about the kind of way you tend to organize a night out with your friends, right? It's much easier to have them in a WhatsApp group or on Slack or Twitter DM, any problem usually being they're all chosen something else to communicate with them, um, than it is to basically phone them all up, right? If you phone them, you're a bit dependent on them being there to pick up the phone when you, when you phone them. Right. You send them a message, they can look at it in the next 10 minutes when they're free. And it's exactly the same reason why we tend to prefer asynchronous conversations. Right. Because someone can pick up the message when they're ready. It's the idea of having a mailbox. 
So reactive systems borrow this idea from flow-based programming of having a service that has a buffered connector on which it receives an incoming message into which it puts an outgoing message. And those services, much like nodes, rather than being SOA style, oh, I maintain state and I maintain data, should be much more a data flow programming style model which says, I make a transformation to the data in some way. Typically, we tend to think of them as being a verb or noun combination, like place and order or onboard a restaurant. And workflows, specific use cases, are usually data flowing between a number of nodes which perform individual transportation steps. The information packets, we tend to think of as commands, sometimes nowadays folks say uh, messaging, which essentially are things that I'm being told. Could be an instruction, it could be effectively um, a, a, a request, right? or events, which are facts, things about the past that I've often done. So when we think about the flow, it may be that I receive a command, do some work, and then push a command to the next node in the flow. Or it may be that I receive a command, I do some work, and then I communicate an event which describes what happened. Or it may well be most commonly I do both. So basically, if I get a, a purchase request, I may have a node that basically does some uh, checkout processing, which involves pricing basically that item. And then I may say, hey, I need the payment system to take a payment for this. So I will send it a command. It will basically then take a payment for me. Much like data flow programming, in reactive architectures, we tend to recommend that you think about these services as being single-threaded and scale them out. One of the advantages of being single-threaded is, of course, that you can maintain ordering. As soon as you have a multi-threaded service, you will lose ordering because you can't, you're, 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 you're deordering the buffer as soon as you read from it. That also implies that you would need to partition. That's why things like Kafka work on a partition basis. Right? Okay. If you don't care about ordering, you can use more of a competing consumers approach where multiple individual single-threaded workers read from a given buffer. So we are thinking about what we uh, this idea of coordinating data flow. We partition our system, and by that we mean how do we slice it up into individual parts to create a continuous steady flow of information. Typically, you want to look for things that represent, if you like, processing steps. Often a really good model is to look for processing steps that are parallelizable. I can do this, and I can pass it down the line. I can then do another one of this, or someone else does the later step. These two steps don't need to be done together, so I can break them apart, and I can parallelize them. What would the inside of a node look like? So here we're going to basically step away slightly um, from some of the reactive people and look at uh, some work by Pat Helland. Anyone know who Pat is? A few of you? Okay. So Pat's really important in the kind of service space. He also was the guy that created MSDTC, worked on Tandem nonstop, later said, let's not do distributed transactions anymore. Um, uh, and his work basically effectively includes things that generate ideas like outboxes, etc. So Pat's got a um, uh, reasonably recent paper out called Autonomous Components. You should probably read if you're interested in some of these ideas. So Pat basically says that effectively what happens in a typical node is that a node has an explicit boundary, right? Which is basically the ports, if you like, from our reactive model. So explicitly you have these ports where we communicate with the outside world. What do we mean by ports? Essentially something that basically says, here is a definition of a message that I send or receive, um, uh, and here's the protocol I'm going to receive it on. Um, and here's any additional information about what might go in headers, et cetera, that I need you to worry about. Right. And so that's an explicit boundary that we communicate. 
We receive messages in over basically one of these ports. Internally in your code, it should probably be extracted from you. And you send one to a port, basically. I have a message. I can't see my screen anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. I think someone's saying that I'm uh, obscuring the antenna on the mic. Um, uh, so, uh, having received basically a message on one of these ports, um, uh, we tend to kick off what's called an activity. So, an activity is really just your code and some state that your code needs. So the idea is, let's say that effectively I am pricing an order. I would say, OK, great. I have got basically this activity, pricing an order, that I'm going to kick off. I would record usually the incoming message, which says, I've received a message requiring pricing for this basket. And that resource is basically the basket that I am pricing. And then typically, my activity may well be some kind of state machine that has a number of steps. So perhaps validating, pricing. And then essentially, what I may need to do is coordinate later steps in the workflow. So I act effectively as an orchestrator. I don't need to have an external saga from a command process, uh, uh, from a message processor. I don't need to have basically a, an API gateway doing that. I know that essentially this thing needs to take a payment. And at that point, effectively, I will save my state so that I can be resumed. And I will call out to another server, sending it a command basically across a, an, an outport and wait for a response. When I call out, it is important that effectively I have probably updated the state of my basket to say it is awaiting effectively payment, that essentially I coordinate that with sending the message on the outport. And that leads to this idea of transactional messaging. It's going to be a problem if I update the resource, the basket in our example, to say that it is awaiting payment, that is the state I have reached, if I never send the message. Because my broker could fail to send the message, and I can't include it in some kind of distributed transaction, because typically it doesn't support the same DTC coordinator, in transactional messaging, I typically write both to the outbox, the message I intend to send, and the change to the resource indicating what state I've moved it to where it's now pending a message. That means I clearly know in my state, hey, I've got a basket waiting for a pricing request, and here is the message I sent to get pricing. Okay. Now, the trouble with my outbox is that I can't always know whether the failure to send to the broker was because the broker didn't respond telling me it actually had sent the message, or whether the broker effectively um, hadn't sent the message at all. It's a problem with distributed systems, right? I can't know that the lack of a response was a failure of the, of the communication between me and the broker, or whether essentially it was due to the fact that they genuinely couldn't send something. So that means I may have to resend from my outbox when something essentially um, uh, is not marked as dispatched. And because it could actually have been dispatched, that means I will send duplicates. And that's why we tend to refer to guaranteed at least once delivery when we talk about this model of uh, transactional messaging. Because I can guarantee I send it to you by keeping basically uh, polling that outbox to see what needs to be sent and sending it until I mark it dispatched, but at the risk that the failure to mark it dispatched was an error and it effectively had been dispatched. So that tends to lead to me needing to an inbox, which says, what have I already seen? And if I've already seen it, I cannot do the work. I can deduplicate. 
And that leads us to have a model where effectively with inside our service, we typically have an inbox messages I'm receiving and an outbox messages I've sent. Pat's point is that essentially in some cases that may be all the state that you need because you can determine the state of an operation that is actually happening within inside your node by simply looking at the messages you've sent and the messages you've received. You know exactly where you are in a given workflow. So if you're not managing the state of a particular resource, you can still persist effectively the state of a workflow without necessarily requiring to manage the workflow explicitly. Okay. So the inbox has told me what I've received, so I know how far I got, provided the outbox message has been sent that corresponds to that step. Okay. So here you can see the model that I'm using is I'm saying, okay, at checkout, I'm going to go through validation, pricing, request payment. At that point, effectively, I need to basically send a message to the next node downstream, which takes the payment. That may be very good for me to actually make that basically a parallelizable uh, uh, unit, because it may well be calling an external payment provider, which may be down for some reason, which may, may have to basically be a synchronous interaction. So I would like to effectively make it asynchronous by buffering my request to it. When it is done, I will receive a payment made message. And typically by a correlation ID or a natural correlation ID like the order ID, when I receive that back, I can effectively go and see what state my activity had reached for that given order, and then move it on to purchase made. And then I may raise basically another message out of my node saying there is a new order. And these activities are what govern code, and these activities replace the need for external um, uh, processes that are essentially like sagas or API gateways. And errors are just a similar flow, right? When we talk about business errors, particularly payment refused, it's just another port that effectively take payment can use that essentially results in me as an activity saying, hey, I need to send a message saying, you know, give me a new card. Because of the buffering between the nodes, we are resilient to failure of a node. If a node fails, we simply queue work. When the node resumes, it'll pick up work from the buffer and just continue processing as normal. And we say this gives us bulkheads to failure. So think of a ship. Ship has various, a series of compartments. If one of those compartments is hold, although it floods, the ship won't sink. The other compartments keep it, up, keep it afloat. Similarly, our system won't collapse because we simply lose a node, which may be a transient failure. We'll just restart one, right, with uh, Lambda or Kubernetes. When we bring it back up, it can pull the messages off the buffer. One of the problems that we get into is that people try to effectively break out of this reactive model into a more classic OO model and make a call to some kind of pricing component at this point saying, hey, well, this node needs to get the price, so I'm going to make basically a call to try and get that directly. And typically, the concern we have is that you make some kind of HTTP get uh, from within inside your checkout service saying, oh, can you just get me the price of this? Or you know, can you check the pricing that the customer has put in the basket is actually still correct? right?" So uh, you may or may not know, but the reason the Titanic sank was because although the Titanic had bulkheads, they didn't have bulkheads up to the top of the ship because that would have interrupted the ability of the first class passengers to promenade along their deck, showing off their fine clothing. So the bulkheads stopped, which meant that when the basic one of the compartments flooded, it overtopped and began to basically fill the, bulk, the, 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 part, the compartments next to it, leading to the Titanic sinking. And essentially, when you have an asynchronous message passing reactive architecture and you choose to make HTTP gets, you are effectively allowing the first class passengers to promenade upon your deck and you will sink when you hit an iceberg. Right. So learn from the Titanic and don't do that. So we know what the answer is to this model, right? We looked at it in flow-based programming. One or two options. The first 
It simply is another node that I talk to. I send a message saying, hey, please price this for me. And it gives me a response back saying, here is the price. All right. Just another, basically, uh, message that I send. And my activity is suspended. And I rec record something in my outbox and then something in my inbox. The other alternative is what Pat Allen calls reference data, which is that lookup model. I listen to messages basically from some kind of pricing component, which is giving me a catalog. And I have that locally, and I can use that to look up the pricing information. The way I often talk about this is, you know, it's a bit the equivalent of uh, my customer. I send them a physical catalog which has prices, and the agents that take calls for customers for order have the same catalog, and they can confirm the prices. So typically, what when, this is a very common model for us is called event carriage state transfer. When, when we do it by messaging, is to say let's listen to mess the new catalog messages, store them locally in the checkout component, and use it as a lookup. Now, of course, this does make us eventually consistent because we may have stale prices. But Reactive talks about this trade-off between eventual consistency, often thought of as latency, right, and resilience or availability. And we typically, we are trading off having available system for one that basically may have to cope with eventual consistency. And there is a, usually a simple solution. For example, the customer tell you, on the customer's basket, you understand what version of pricing catalog the front end was using. And then when you come to price, if it turns out your latest version in your lookup table is basically an earlier version of the catalog, you typically just delay processing until effectively that one filters through. The other thing that's quite common when we think about reactive in this model of resiliency is the idea of uh, implementing the let it crash pattern or crash only software. So the idea behind crash-only software is that we can spend an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how to make our software resilient to failure. But often that failure is transient, difficult to recover from because we're at depth. Um, and recovery may actually attempts at recovery may put us in a worse or very more, much more complicated position. So the let it crash pattern is the idea that we just say, hey, in the event of some kind of exceptional failure, we just simply crash our component. Right, it's the it's the software architecture version. Have you have, have you tried turning on or off again? Right. So, if you implement this approach, what you begin to realize is that when I restart up, one of the things I have to do is accept that I may have terminated because I crashed, and the first thing I should do is attempt to recover anything that was potentially in flight. Now, if we think about the model we were talking about. Right, we tend to have everything we need in a reactive system to do that. Provided I never act or acknowledge, in other words, basically allow effectively an offset to be committed or a message to be deleted off a queue for the connector that comes into my component, I will never effectively have reached the point where I've updated my state to show it processed until I've completed that action. So if I crash halfway through, that message will be still available and waiting on my buffer for me to process next time I start up. My resource has only been updated prior to my effectively acting that message. My inbox helps me against duplicated requests. And my outbox will tell me what I intended to send. And those allow me to have a model where I say, just crash it. Just crash it, and we'll recover the work when we start up. Right. Yeah, OK. All right. So again, we also need to think about this model of kind of push and pull, or back pressure and load shedding, right? We may have the option with the middleware we're using to select push or pull. Push would effectively say, give us the messages as they arrive. And pull would say, we will poll for them. In order to basically, uh, with put, but polling, it is much easier to control back pressure, because you can stop requesting when you're full enough. With push, 
it's a little bit harder because the thing upstream will keep shoving you messages. So one of the problems you'll meet with something like AWS Lambda is it's going to keep pushing to your component. You don't have the capacity to apply back pressure. Your main, uh, your main choice at that point is load shedding. So when you want to apply back pressure, what you need to be able to do is control your ability to, con to, to consume stuff and be able to pause it if you need to. A circuit breaker is, if you like, a model where effectively we say, we think there is a transient error. Crashing probably won't help us. We'll just restart and still hit this thing that's a transient error. The database is not available. The payment provider has gone down. So what we'll do is essentially we will temporarily stop consuming messages. Then we'll let a test one through. If that one works, then we'll turn on the taps and start, and start moving. So circuit breakers are really useful in this model because they essentially say, apply back pressure. Stop consuming from the buffer. But also be aware that load shedding, just as in you know, flow-based programming, is a valid alternative at this point. Right? If it doesn't matter that downstream doesn't receive information from you because it's likely to be out of date if you passed it on in a while, simply drop the load at that point. So in order to remain responsive, you will need to scale. Because typically, the model we are looking for is to make these services single-threaded so that essentially we don't have any problems uh, with concurrency. So when you scale out, obviously, you have a couple of options, typically, with messaging. There's the competing consumers model where effectively it says the ordering doesn't matter. I'm reading for some kind of queue. Each work item can be actioned independently. I, I can just scale up by introducing new ones that read the same buffer. Right? So if I've got a basket and it needs pricing, it isn't impacted by the pricing of any other baskets in the queue. So I can just use a queue at that point, and I can scale out of our competing consumers by adding additional consumers of that, basically, of, that, of, that, of that, those messages. If ordering is important, right, perhaps I basically have changes that essentially need to be applied in sequence in order to make sense. Uh, I may be using a stream with Kafka, for example, to preserve ordering. Then I'll need to partition. Right. Typically, the middleware, the broker will handle partitioning for you by a scheme known as consistent hashing, which means effectively it will always tend to give the same worker things that basically hash to the same range. And the advantage of scaling tends to be that if something has a fault, we may already have other items that are able to take over the load of the processing. And so we remain responsive even in the event of failure. We can also effectively, you know, typically restart something to replace that one quite quickly in a modern environment. Uh, routing is really, this one is basically about the fact that if we are single-threaded, we need to partition, which I mentioned earlier, right? And being single-threaded inside these components, which is something that I think throws a few people because they tend to have, you know, thread pools dealing with work, etc., is hugely advantageous. It significantly simplifies your programming model. And if you're reading from a queue, you can be single-threaded. Because you just scale by introducing new instances or partitioning, basically, effectively, to allocate to new ones. All right, so just to kind of recap, when we think about reactive systems, we are borrowing from the ideas basically that are expressed by reactive programming, where effectively we want to focus on the flow through the system. And we think of nodes basically which, pro which, which are processing steps and have data flowing between them as opposed to a kind of OOSOA model where we think about data and behavior being co-located. And within basically a system scale rather than a programming scale, we think about that being message driven. So we use basically messaging middleware. And that messaging connector or buffer, right, 
allows us to be resilient to failure by giving us bulkheads. And it allows us to be elastic because we can introduce new single-threaded processes of basically of those connections, either by partitioning or competing consumers, which allows us to continue to be responsive to our users even in the event of failure. All right. And that is that. Um, I've got like four minutes uh, if, there are, also if there are any questions. Um, you can always come and ask questions at the bottom afterwards. And uh, I do take DMs on Twitter. Um, hopefully that is a bit of an understanding of what people mean when they talk about a reactive architecture. Um, it's one that's basically message-driven, message which gives you uh, elastic resilience and responsiveness, and it's using those reactive programming concepts. You don't have to use an actor framework to build a reactive architecture. That's one of the things you should take away as well. Right? They are very useful, but you can build reactive architectures with any system that involves message passing and nodes. All right. I can't see any questions, although I am blinded by the light. Oh, there's one at the front. OK. So the question was, does gRPC fit well into the model? No, is the answer. So gRPC effectively is a synchronous conversation between two components. In the event that basically you lose one component, you can't base your conversation breaks. So uh, messaging gives you that basically buffer, which means you can be asynchronous. Any other questions? I think there's one over here. Oh gosh, you might have to shout. Uh, when it comes to the control packets brackets, uh, do the sender check the back pressure uh, of the next node against the expected size of the packages in the control brackets? It, it, is, it expects to send, or does it work some other magic way? So the question really is about basically the ability to apply back pressure. So in reactive programming, you have a slight advantage in the sense that you'll tend to know the capacity of your buffer, and you'll tend to be able to understand if the, if the buffer is full. In a reactive system, you don't tend to have that so easily, because you don't really know the capacity of the queue. You may not have a capacity. So what you're looking at more is your input buffer to you when you are receiving messages, and how fast or slow you want to go. So it is basically the consumer that needs to control the rate. That's why polling is easier than pushing, because by polling you can say, stop, I'm not, I'm not going to take anymore. If it's push, you have to have a mechanism to say, via the push mechanism, please don't give me any more until I ask you to give me more again. Right? So you kind of you have to suspend the push until basically it comes back. So Kafka, for example, has polling out the box, so it's fairly straightforward, as there's something like, SQS, which works basically over HTTP anyway. Something like Rabbit, where it actually pushes an option, it, it works, but you have to basically suspend being pushed to when effectively you decide that you've got too much capacity, in which case it's a bit like being a circuit breaker. You say, hey, stop sending me stuff right now. Right. Oh, question over there. Okay, so the question basically is keeping track of all my nodes and data to queue, something else. So observability is your is is what you have to do with any distributed system, right? You have to move to a world of logs, metrics, and traces. Traces, particularly um, for systems that basically work in this kind of way, because you get to see basically the spans and activities, and you can see where stuff moves inside its workflow. But yeah, um, you need to start investing in observability if you are going to use this approach. 